reached agreement on the guiding principles, standards, criteria, and procedures of the BRICS expansion process, which has been in discussion for quite a while. We have consensus on the first phase of this expansion process, and other phases will follow. We have decided to invite the Argentine Republic, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates to become full members of BRICS. The membership will take effect from the 1st of January 2024. A reformed multilateralism entails inclusivity, cooperation, and diversity of voices and interests. By amplifying voices from various corners of the globe, we can collaboratively work for an equitable and peaceful world. In an ever interdependent world, Collectivity is essential to adequately solve global challenges. Transnational problems require joint solutions. Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous country, with around 120 million people, a greater majority of which are young and dynamic. This demographic dividend, if harnessed properly, can be a significant asset for cooperation through driving innovation, consumption, and providing a large workforce. Located in the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia also serves as a crucial gateway between Africa, the Middle East, and wider Asia. My country has also recorded one of the highest economic growth rates in Africa and has showcased its potential to become one of the continent's largest economies. This growth is backed by a mix of agriculture, manufacturing, and service, demonstrating a diversified and resilient economy. Our rich historic past, the breadth and depth of our bilateral ties across the world, as well as being for runners in the, in the establishment of key global and regional multilateral institutions, not only makes Ethiopia an instrumental to BRICS block, but a key voice for inclusivity in the global arena. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us. You're watching our weekly program on OBN uh, Horn of Africa. In this edition today, we'll be talking about the uh, BRICS affair. And I joined by uh, Professor Lawrence Freeman. Thank you for joining me. I'm pleasure to be with you. How do you see the establishment of BRICS and the recent development and the meetings in South Africa? What we're seeing now, especially with the recent BRICS summit that ended on Thursday in South Africa, and with the addition now of six nations, which brings the number of nations in the BRICS to 11, that we have witnessed a fundamental change in the reality of politics and economics uh, in the world today. There is now a alternative institution to the rules-based order dominated by the West. There's an alternative economic institution to the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. And even though the BRICS uh, is small in terms of its uh, financial lending capacity, it represents in embryo an entirely alternate political economic system, a system that's dedicated to economic growth. 
uh, and this has changed the world. It cannot be put back in. So we're living as of today in a new world, in a new universe with the emergence of the BRICS. Okay, some uh, economists uh, uh, say that uh, the, the establishment of BRICS would uh, create uh, a multipolar world, which is unlike the previous uh, imperialist move. What's your take? Well, absolutely. The multipolar world has already emerged. The unipolar world, where the West has hegemony in their rules-based order, in their geopolitical zero-sum game view, that unipolar world is over. Uh, it's been broken. It's been broken by the uh, conflict we're, uh, in Russia, between Russia and Ukraine, and it is now completely broken by the expansion of the BRICS. And we've seen other sides of it. We've seen more and more independence by what's called the Global South or the South-South nations. We've seen more trade deals being conducted outside of the U.S. dollar as the primary currency. And even the situation in West Africa, where Niger has uh, rebelled against the uh, military and economic policies of the French and the United States is another indication. The unipolar world is over. Now the question is what kind of policies will we be able to implement in the multipolar world that is emerging? Okay, among the African nations, uh, Ethiopia and uh, Egypt lately uh, joined the BRICS membership. And uh, what are those reasons for Egypt and Ethiopia to be chosen as a member? I think you have to look at the fact that, first of all, uh, both countries uh, have very large populations. Ethiopia, probably 115 million or more. Egypt, 105 million or more. Uh, Ethiopia uh, dominates East Africa and the Horn of Africa by its size and by its economy. Uh, equally, Egypt in the north of the continent has similar relations. Both nations have pursued uh, aggressive industrial economic policies. Um, Ethiopia's uh, had in the past a very uh, positive growth rate and expansion rate and investment in infrastructure. Uh, Egypt is as well, has as well. Now we have Egypt in the far northeast, we have Ethiopia in the east, and we have South Africa in the far south. So these three countries, three pillars of the African continent, are now almost one-third of the 11 nations of the BRICS. Uh, and this uh, is a very positive development for Ethiopia, for Africa, and for the world. The buzzword uh, that comes to everyone's mind is de-dollarization whenever we talk about this uh, new block, the BRICS. Uh, to what extent would the emergence of uh, BRICS uh, affect the dollar uh, mighty potential? Well, it's already being affected. The uh, BRICS, I did not expect the BRICS would come out with a alternative new currency. I think they discussed it behind closed doors, but they weren't going to uh, initiate it. What is being initiated is more and more trade being conducted outside of the dollar. I think the uh, BRICS has their own bank. It's called the New Development Bank, relatively small. I think maybe 30 billion lending capacity. But they're talking about having 30% of the loans be denominated in non other than dollar currency, dollar denomination. So what we're seeing, and, and we saw it before the meetings uh, last week, is we're seeing a new institution, but even bef even before the expansion of the BRICS, more and more countries, uh, India and Russia, India and Kenya, and they're trading in local currencies, they're trading in rubles, uh, they're trading in rupees, they're trading in shillings. So this movement, although it's small, a tiny percentage of world trade, is growing, and it will continue to grow. The, the dollar and the IMF World Bank system have lost their complete control 
of the economy. And that's good. I'm not saying we should eliminate the dollar. But we now have independence politically and growing independence economically among larger and larger sections of the world population and nations. We lately uh, heard that uh, even the strong ally of uh, United States of America, uh, Saudi Arabia, has joined the BRICS, uh, which is... Yes, it's very significant that Saudi Arabia has joined the BRICS. And of course, they're one of the largest oil producing countries. Uh, in the world. So they bring with them a, a, a different economy and they bring with them now a very strong uh, oil reserve capability. And I think what this indicates, uh, and we saw it uh, earlier where uh, China helped negotiate arrangements between Iran and Saudi Arabia earlier this year, that more and more of the uh, developing sector, what we call the South-South, countries out of control, not in the control of the G7, or the, they are now seeing the reality of the positive potential of moving towards another institution. And obviously, with, the, with the Saudi Arabia joining, this now is a clear indication that the hegemony of the West and their rules-based order uh, has been broken and will not be put back in the box. So to speak. Okay, uh, being a member of the BRICS wouldn't spoil the relationship of each nation with that of the US or others? Well, it shouldn't, because actually, um, as President Xi has often said, that mankind shares common aim. All nations share the common aim or should of development of their people, material, physical standard of living, and nurturing of the creative spark that each individual is born with. However, the West doesn't see it that way. The rules-based order thinks that they should be in control, they should be on top, and they uh, should not allow any other power in the world to usurp what they think is their given right to control. But that now is gone. So if the West was able to think clearly, intelligently, they would recognize the world has changed and that their old methods of control and domination and insisting on their brand of democracy and good governance and human rights no longer work. And they, if they were intelligent, they would adjust and change their thinking because there's no inherent objective contradiction between what the BRICS wants and what the rest of the world wants. Now, I don't know what the United States is going to do. I don't know if they're going to retaliate. I don't know if they're going to accommodate. I don't know what Western Europe is going to do. What would Africa benefit from the existence of this new bloc, the BRICS? Well, what you're going to is now you have two more countries joining, both with large populations. Uh, you can expect an increase in trade, an increase in commerce, uh, increase in loans. Uh, Ethiopia magnificently has developed the GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on their own, but they need a lot more infrastructure. They need low interest, long-term loans. Uh, Egypt has done a marvelous job of expanding the Nile. So you're going to see an increase of trade among these countries. You're going to see potentially an increase of long-term credit, and that should lead to economic development, and especially in the area of infrastructure, manufacturing, and agricultural processing. Those are the three areas I would hope to see uh, positive results in. For your knowledge, what are the major criteria to be chosen by uh, the BRICS as a member? I think they look at questions of political history, economic potential, economic history, uh, relations with other countries, I think all these factors go into it, but I'm not aware of any specific criteria. Do you believe that the West uh, may propose a counter approach to, to contend with the BRICS now on? That's uh, an interesting question I've been giving a lot of thought to over the last few weeks, even prior to the BRICS summit. The, the new rules-based order and the IMF World Bank system has failed. They've not helped any country. Niger is an example of a country that got overthrew 
the military that the U.S. trained. And the U.S. has six uh, military bases in Niger. France has 1,500 troops in Niger. And they've been uh, overthrown. Why? Because they failed to improve the standard of living of the people. The Nigerians live in the worst conditions in the world. 3% of the population has access to electricity. 3%. So the West now should think and reflect. Now, can they reflect? Can they change the policies? Can they join with the BRICS in the terms of a common interest? Africa and the South-South need hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars of investment in infrastructure, in manufacturing, in agriculture. There's no inherent competition. There's only the possibility of joint development for the future of mankind. Now, will the United States and the other Western countries uh, and the geopolitical ideologues who control these countries, are they capable of reflecting? Are they capable of changing? That's the question that's on the table because the horse is out of the barn, barn, as we say in the U.S. The unipolar world will not come back. The universe has changed and the West has to face that reality. Okay, the West have uh, this uh, NATO, which is merely uh, this, uh, which has uh, a military orientation, whereas the new bloc, uh, the BRICS, is economic uh, oriented uh, union. Do you think uh, this BRICS member also coined uh, another uh, a, a military uh, partnership to defend? Uh, their 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 interest in in this uh, upcoming new world order. I'm not aware of any discussions that the BRICS are going to follow the pathway of NATO. NATO, don't forget, came into existence in opposition to quote so-called controlling the expansion of the old USSR. Well, the USSR went out of existence in the early 1990s, and NATO has not only expanded uh, across the continent there, closer and closer to the borders of Russia, but NATO now is essentially also expanding into Southeast Asia, uh, making threats against China concerning Taiwan. So this, this military alliance has outlived its usefulness, and I don't see any purpose in the BRICS emulating that feature of the West's policy. Okay. Uh... Where, where should we, I mean, uh, I mean, see the world, the new world order in the next one or two decades with, with, with this contention zone? My, my hope, and this is something I've been fighting for my whole adult life, is that we will have a group of nations in the BRICS and outside of the BRICS who will realize that the most important question facing humankind right now is the elimination of poverty and the elimination of hunger. All sane foreign policy should be based on raising the material standard of living of all populations, of all nations in the world, and developing the creative powers that lie potentially in each human being. That is what we should see. And, then, and I would hope that as a result of the BRICS and other and moves that are taking place across the globe, that we could, I know we could eliminate poverty and hunger in Africa in the next 20 years. Africa right now has the largest number of people living in extreme poverty of any place in the world. That can be eliminated if countries come together with the intention of developing these nations in agriculture, in manufacturing, and in industry. That's my hope of what will happen over the next generation. Okay, do you think the US and uh, its allies regret upon the establishment of this new bloc? Well, no, they don't. Uh, the question is, they thought they were all powerful. They thought they were the gods of Olympus that would rule over the rest of the nations in the world and they could dictate what nations should do and shouldn't do. They have failed to actually help most nations in the world. There's been no U.S.-backed credit development 
of any economy in Africa. The last effort was by John F. Kennedy in the 1960s with Kwame Nkrumah. So for 60 years, we've done nothing to help the material standard of living of the African people. And yet we say, we are your friends. We will export democracy to you. We will oversee human rights. We will give you the best moral criteria for the development of your country. And if you do everything we say, we may let you be a house servants to the rules-based order. That's the mentality. Now that has been shattered. That has been shown to be a failure by a number of incidents that we've been discussing, including the BRICS in West Africa. The question now, is the West smart enough to adjust the policy, to modify the policy, so they actually are in accord and coherence with the majority of the rest of the world? I mean, don't forget, before the addition of these six countries, the BRICS represented a third of the GDP in the world, more than the G7, and 40% of the world's population. Now, that's going to grow when these six new nations join the BRICS in January of 2024. So they're going to be approaching half of the world's population and over a third of the world's economy. The West should realize they've got to change. Otherwise, will they put themselves on a collision course to war and confrontation? That's possible. But as an American, I hope my country is not that foolish. Okay, do you think the US and uh, its allies regret upon the establishment of this new bloc? Well, no, they don't. Uh, the question is, they thought they were all powerful. They thought they were the gods of Olympus that would rule over the rest of the nations in the world and they could dictate what nations should do and shouldn't do. They have failed to actually help most nations in the world. There's been no U.S. back credit development of any economy in Africa. The last effort was by John F. Kennedy in the 1960s with Kwame Nkrumah. So for 60 years, we've done nothing to help the material standard of living of the African people. And yet we say, we are your friends. We will export democracy to you. We will oversee human rights. We will give you the best moral criteria for the development of your country. And if you do everything we say, we may let you be a house servants to the rules-based order. That's the mentality. Now that has been shattered. That has been shown to be a failure by a number of incidents that we've been discussing, including the BRICS in West Africa. The question now, is the West smart enough to adjust the policy, to modify the policy, so they actually are in accord and coherence with the majority of the rest of the world. I mean, don't forget before the addition of these six countries, the BRICS represented a third of the GDP in the world, more than the G7, and 40% of the world's population. Now that's gonna grow when these six new nations join the BRICS in January of 2024. So they're gonna be approaching half of the world's population and over a third of the world's economy. The West should realize they've got to change. Otherwise, will they put themselves on a collision course to war and confrontation? That's possible. But as an American, I hope my country is not that foolish. Viewers, thank you for watching our program. This brings you to the end of our edition for today. See you next time with another edition. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good one.